Welcome to the Central Church YouTube channel. We hope that today's message blesses you in some way. Consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to stay current with all the content we put online. Thanks again for being with us, and remember, you are loved at Central. It is good to see you today, and it's good to get to worship with you today. Uh, my name's Ethan. I get the privilege of serving as the pastor here at Central. And so um, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, I just want you to know how grateful I am uh, that you've chosen to worship here with us, whether today is your first time or whether uh, you have been here over the last several weeks or several months. I mean, I'm excited to get to worship together today and excited to celebrate the grand opening of uh, our remodeled worship center and remodeled lobby. Um, we are excited about all the work that has gone in to this uh, and gone into this day uh, to make this day happen. Uh, but know this, uh, that we aren't excited about paint and carpet and chairs or uh, walls being blown out or anything like that. We're excited to make room for more. Uh, we're excited to be able to make room for more of our neighbors, uh, more of our friends, more of our family members to come and, and to worship with us. And so if that's you, if you're here worshiping with us for the first time, man, we're so excited. Uh, and we want you to know uh, that we, uh, we did this uh, so that hopefully you can encounter uh, the living God here in this place, uh, on this campus, in these facilities. Now, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 is where uh, we are going to be today, uh, where we're going to spend our time together uh, this morning. Jeremiah 29, and we're going to read just one verse. We're going to read verse 7. Uh, we'll read that here in just a minute. Uh, I was doing some reading this week uh, on the, the moving habits of American citizens. Um, and I read this, that the average American is expected to move 11.4 times in their lifetime. The average American will move 11.4 times in their lifetime. Now, I'm not smart enough to know how you move 0.4 of a time, so let's just go with 12, right? The average American will move 12 times in their uh, lives. Uh, now, some of you, uh, that number boggles your mind because you can't imagine moving once or twice, let alone 11 or 12 times. Uh, my family, uh, the family that I came from, we don't move, right? They stay in one place. They've been in the same area of Florida, I think since Noah, but I'm not, uh, I'm not positive. Um, now, my wife's family, uh, they're a little more nomadic, we might say, right? They uh, move uh, from time to time. And so maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you'd say, hey, yeah, I get it. Uh, my mother-in-law, she talks about enjoying moving because she never accumulates a lot of junk right? Uh, she is always cleaning out, always able uh, to get rid of some different things. Uh, but for the average American, moving regularly is just part of life. It's just part of what they do. Now, some people move uh, because they want to, right? Some people move because they want to uh, go try a new area. Maybe they have accepted a new job. Uh, maybe a new opportunity has opened, and so they move uh, from one place to another. Uh, others move because they have to. Maybe a, a situation has changed. Maybe a circumstance has changed. Maybe they don't have a lot of freedom in the choice. They have to move nonetheless. Well, here in Jeremiah 29, what we find is we find God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to his people who are on the move. But they're on the move not because they want to move or because they're excited about the move. They're, they're on the move because they have been conquered by Babylon and they have now been taken into exile. They have been removed from their promised land. They've been removed from their homes and they have been moved. They have been sent to Babylon in exile 
exile. So look with me here at Jeremiah chapter 29. Let me invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's perfect and precious word here in Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, We're going to look just at verse 7. The Spirit says to us this morning here, starting in verse 7, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Let me read that one more time. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. This is God's word. You can be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word that is true. Lord, thank you that you have spoken to us. Father, thank you that you have come near to us in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray uh, even now uh, that you would speak to us through your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we look here at this passage, we're going to hold on to this truth, kind of the main truth of the passage, that gospel hope frees you to love where you live. Gospel hope frees you to love where you live. That, that's really what Yahweh, what the Lord is calling Israel to do here. Uh, in the face of exile, in the face of the unknown, he is calling them to love where they live. As we look here at verse 7, first we see this, that your address matters. Your address matters. Your address is not an accident. You were placed by God where you live. You were placed by God where you were. You were placed by God where you play. That it is all part of God's sovereign plan where you live, where you work, and where you play. And yet in that, in that plan, God has called you to love. He's called us to love where we live. Now, when we talk about loving where we live, we don't want this to just be a cute or a quaint phrase. We don't want this uh, to just be a bumper sticker. We want this to be the truth. So maybe when you came in, you saw uh, those magnets that are out there that say, I love Sanford, or I love DeBerry, or or, I love Lake Mary. Maybe you walked by and maybe you got angry because you didn't see your community there. Uh, Well, just know if you live in Deltona or Orange City or Heathrow, you're magnets are on the way, right? We love Deltona. We love Orange City. We love Heathrow, but Sticker Mule does not, all right? So it's, uh, it is uh, their fault. You'll have to come back next week, right? It's the hook. It's, it's how we get you. Um, but uh, we do love Osteen, right? We've got the Osteen magnet. So uh, if you are from Osteen and you need a magnet, one of the four of you, we got you, all right? Uh, so uh, we, uh, we are, I'm just playing. We love Osteen. There's more than four of you. Uh, we know, right? Uh, we, uh, but we, loving where you live, is more than just a phrase, right? This is really what the Lord has called his people to. Now, before we can understand what's happening here in Jeremiah 29, we need to understand something about Jeremiah and about who Jeremiah is. Jeremiah's a prophet who, uh, he was called, given this ministry as a prophet when he was young. And we know from earlier in Jeremiah that his ministry was always going to be a difficult ministry. It was always going to be a hard ministry. In fact, the Lord calls Jeremiah, gets him excited, and he says, but Jeremiah, I want you to understand this. No one's going to listen to you. No one's going to pay attention to you. It's going to be a difficult ministry. And so the Bible tells us that Jeremiah, he prophesied for 40 years, and he prophesied to a country, uh, to a people who did not want to hear what he had to say. He he was an unpopular prophet, an unpopular message. In fact, one of the things that you'll see as you read through the book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah is constantly waging war. He's constantly fighting uh, with the false prophets of the day. Excuse me, that Jeremiah would... He would issue a prophecy, and the false prophets would come in, and they would say, no, don't listen to Jeremiah. This is what's going to happen. We're even going to see this um, in the context of this passage today. And so at the end of his ministry, uh, Israel, really, we could say Judah more specifically, uh, are sent into exile. They, uh, they're sent uh, as punishment um, to, uh, to Babylon. And the Lord speaks to Jeremiah, and he pins this letter to Israel so that they would know what does it mean uh, to live lives that honor God, that honor Yahweh in Babylon. 
Now, Babylon was not just another city. Babylon was, what one commentator said, the capital of the pagan world. Everything that was opposed to Yahweh, everything that was opposed to what Israel stood for, everything that was opposed to who God is and his holiness and his goodness, Babylon stood in favor of. And so Israel, they're taken into captivity. They're, they're taken into exile. And the Lord knew that they would be tempted to, rather than flourish, they would be tempted to sulk. To rather than multiply, they would be tempted to decrease. In fact, what we know is that when Israel was first taken into exile in Babylon, rather than moving into the city, what they did was they made encampments around the city. We might think of it like this, that rather than moving into the city, they lived in the suburbs. Uh, rather than coming in and uh, getting involved with the city, they decided to remain pulled back. But the Lord, uh, he comes to them and he writes this letter through Jeremiah and, and he says, you were doing it all wrong. Now the Babylonians were smart because this is what they would do. They, it was common that they would conquer a community, they, they would conquer a kingdom, they would conquer a city. And what they would do is they would bring that city to Babylon. But they wouldn't bring everyone from that city. Instead, what they would do is they would bring the leaders and the culture shapers. So if we were to read earlier in Jeremiah 29, we would see that uh, who Babylon brought into exile were the artists and the business leaders and the community leaders and the political leaders of Israel because here's what Babylon knew. And this is important to understand what's happening here. Babylon knew that if they could assimilate the culture makers into their community, into their culture, into their city, then they would eventually release those people to go back home, to go back to the place that they came from. And those people and their children would no longer leave as Israelites, they would leave as Babylonians. They would no, no longer leave trusting in what they knew beforehand. Instead, they would be changed into the image of Babylon. And so Israel knew this. And so they, what they thought in their wisdom, decided they would stay removed. Uh, but the Lord has something different for them. So look with me at verse 7 of Jeremiah 29. He says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Now notice that word that, uh, that this verse starts with, but. Right, this is a word of opposition. He's, uh, he's telling them that there is a different path than the one just mentioned. And so if we were to jump back up to verse 4 and read down to verse 6, we've got this on the screen, uh, you would read this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. The Lord knew that Israel was going to be tempted to decrease. They would be tempted to play defense rather than offense. They would be tempted to kind of put their walls up and seclude into their own little city and into their own little community. And instead, what does the Lord say? He says, don't do that. Instead, seek the welfare of the city. Now, that word welfare uh, is the Hebrew word. Maybe you're familiar with it, shalom. Shalom could be a greeting. It can also be an adjective. It could be a verb. Here he says, seek the shalom. Seek the peace of the city. Now, this peace that he's talking about here, this peace isn't just absence of conflict. It's not just absence of struggle. Instead, it's peace in every area of life. So not just peace in war, but peace in relationships and peace in health and peace in finances. It really carries this idea of wholeness. What he says here is he, he says that the exiles are to seek the flourishing and the blessing of the city. In fact, this is what God's people had always been called to do. If you were to flip back and look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, there the Lord makes a covenant with Abraham. And you remember what he says? He says, I'm going to make you the father of a multitude. 
I'm going to multiply you. But he doesn't say that I'm going to multiply you and make you large and make you strong and make you big uh, so that Israel is well known. Instead, what he says is I'm going to multiply you so that you can be a blessing to the nations. So, so that you could be a blessing to the Gentiles. And so this call here in verse 7, it's really not any different than the covenant that he had made in Genesis chapter 12. Now, how did they end up in Babylon? We've already said uh, that they were taken into exile, right? We've already said that they were exiled. The, the question is, why did they end up in exile? Was the Lord caught off guard? Did he not understand what was going to happen? Well, what we see here in verse 7 is that Israel ends up in exile because the Lord sends them there. Look at verse 7. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. When Babylon conquered Israel, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and told the Israelites that they would be taken into captivity and they would be taken into exile. This wasn't a surprise to God. This was God's plan. Rather, the Lord was going to use this for some reason. I love the way the NIV translates this passage. That The Lord, he didn't just send them into exile. The Lord carried them into exile. And why did he do it? Because of their disobedience in the promised land because of their idolatry and because of their not just spiritual idolatry, but also physical idolatry because they had trusted, they had failed to trust in Yahweh and instead they had decided that they would either trust in themselves, making themselves their own God, or that they would trust in all of these other false gods, all of these other fake gods that couldn't really deliver what they needed and what they promised. Now, this theme of exile, it's not just uh, here in the Old Testament or even in the later Old Testament, but really, this theme of exile runs throughout Scripture. In fact, if you were to keep reading into the New Testament, you would see where the authors of the New Testament, they refer to the church, they refer to believers as exiles. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2. We've got it here on the screen for you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Some translations will translate this as sojourners and strangers. That really captures the, uh, the essence of what does it mean to be an exile. It means to be a stranger. See, as God's people, as believers, we have always been exiles. But unlike Israel, we're not exiled for punishment. Instead, we're exiles because we understand that this world is not our home. We're exiles awaiting our home and our reward to come. And so we're exiles in the sense that we understand that we do not belong here. It's not a punishment. It's because we have been given a new home. We've been given a new hope. Yesterday, right around lunchtime, my sweet wife came and she said, hey, do you want to go on a walk? And my first thought was, no, I do not want to go on a walk. So a few minutes later, we're finishing the walk, and we're, we're, coming, around, we're coming around the bend, and uh, our, our kids had gone with us, and so, um, see, she also, it was a bait and switch, she said, do you want to go on a walk, and then she made me run some. Uh, so uh, our three older kids had, had ridden their bikes, and we had gone around our, our neighborhood's kind of a big oval, we had gone around twice, and uh, we came back, and the walk was finally over, and I get to the driveway, and our three older kids are already there in the driveway, and Haddon, our oldest son, he, he looks at me, and he says, Daddy, are we being punished for something? <laughs> and I said, nobody, why? Why would you think that you're being punished? And he said, because that was not fun. That was not a fun trip. You know, sometimes life in this world is not fun, is it? Sometimes life in this world, we get to the end of the day and we think, am I being punished? W what is happening? What is going on? See, that's part of life in a broken world, isn't it? 
That's part of life in a fallen world. And so as exiles, we feel the reality that I was not made for this world. I was not made for what's happening here. Instead, I was made for the world to come. My heart is longing for that city that we have read about, that city that I've been told about, that city that is paved with streets of gold. That's where I'm looking to, that's where I'm looking for. But unlike Israel, our exile isn't for punishment. But like Israel, our exile is not an accident. See, your address matters. Your address is not an accident. My address is not, it's not an accident that we are sitting at 3101 West State Road 46, Sanford, Florida. We are here because the Lord has brought us here. We're here because the Lord has placed us here. We are here for a purpose, and that purpose is to seek the welfare of our neighbors. That purpose is to be a blessing to our neighbors. And so how can we be a blessing to our neighbors? How do we bless our neighbors? Well, the first way is this, is we show the love of Jesus. Over and over again, when we read through the New Testament, when we look at the life of Jesus, what we see Jesus doing is we see Jesus showing his love as he shares it. We see him meeting physical needs so that the audience will hear as he meets their spiritual needs. And so if we are going to bless our neighbors, first we show the love of Jesus, but if we show the love of Jesus without sharing the love of Jesus, then our showing is pointless. So we show the love of Jesus as we share the love of Jesus, as we share the gospel, as we tell the good news, we share the good news that Jesus has lived and he has died a sinner's death so that we wouldn't have to and he rose again from the grave and he conquered sin and he conquered death and now he offers forgiveness to anyone who will believe. He offers life, he offers heaven, he offers eternity to anyone and everyone who will call on his name. And so if we are going to love our city well, if we are going to love our neighbors well, if we are going to love our place well, then first we've got to understand that our address matters. And this gospel hope that we have been given, it it frees us to love where we live. And so it it frees us to see that our address matters. Next, we see that your prayer matters. Uh, Our prayer matters. Here's the thing. Prayer has always been a mark of what it means to be God's people. In, In fact, when we fail to pray, we fail to be who God has created us and called us and saved us to be. Uh, Prayer isn't something that is optional for God's people any more than oxygen is optional for us today, right? That as we as believers pray and as we pray together, what we're doing is we're breathing together, right? That's where we find our life and our energy uh, for moving forward. And uh, this isn't new. This is the way it's always been. Look at verse seven. It says, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. Israel hadn't just been called to seek the welfare of the city, but to pray for it as well. In other words, they had been called to intervene and intercede before God on behalf of Babylon. Now, if I'm in charge and I'm stuck in exile in a place that I don't want to be with people who don't love me, with people who want to kill me, then I'm not praying that God would bless the city. I'm praying that God would judge the city. But here in verse seven, the Lord doesn't tell Israel to seek the judgment of the city, does he? He says to seek the welfare of the city and pray for the Lord on its behalf. This is the only place in the Old Testament where Israel is commanded to pray for unbelievers and to pray for enemies. And we learn something important here. We, we live in a cultural moment that oftentimes feels like it is opposed to everything that the Lord has called us to be. We live in a moment 
where it feels like all of the world around us is getting darker and darker and darker. And yet we learn here in verse 7 that the way for God's people to survive a hostile culture is not through anger at the culture, but through love for the people. I mean, we think that, man, it's getting harder and harder to be a Christian. We, we might lose some freedoms. Friends, we've got to understand that Israel had no freedoms here. Right, that they lived in a moment, they lived in a time where it wasn't just frowned upon to belong to Yahweh, it was illegal. It wasn't just frowned upon to follow the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, it was a capital offense that would lead you to death. And yet what does the Lord tell his people to do? He says, seek the welfare of the city and pray for the city. See, life in Babylon, it wasn't like moving from Florida to Montana. Although I think that where it snows is a sign of God's judgment, right? And so uh, the Lord has placed us here near the beach because we're blessed and highly favored and he loves us. But it wasn't like moving from Florida to Montana where things look different. Things feel different. We know that we're not where we're supposed to be or, or where we're from, but we'll get through. This, this exile was more like moving from the United States to North Korea. It, it was the equivalent of the North Koreans coming to the United States, conquering the United States, and, and taking us and planting us in North Korea and saying, you will learn our language, you will learn our culture, you will learn our customs, you will worship what we tell you to worship, when we tell you to worship, how we tell you to worship. And it's into that situation that the Lord says to seek the welfare of the city and pray for the city. We might expect God's word to his people to be to fight but instead, it's put down roots and pray for Babylon. Now, it wasn't uncommon for Israel to, to pray for their city. Psalm 122, we read to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But it would have been scandalous for Israel to be praying for Babylon. Babylon was the capital of the pagan world. It was Las Vegas on steroids. What happened in Babylon stayed in Babylon, right? This, this wasn't a place that was typically looked at for its holiness and looked at for its cleanliness and, and looked at for its wholesomeness. No, this was a place that God's people typically wanted to stay as far away from as they could. And yet the Lord says, I don't want you to just go there. I don't want you to just live there. I want you to seek the welfare of the city. Seek the peace of the city. Pray for the city. This city was opposed to everything about Yahweh. And yet he tells his people to pray, not to fight. So ultimately, what he's doing here is he, he's calling his people, and the same is true for us today, to be present in our communities. Look at what he's already commanded there in verse 7. He said, plant your lives, plant your families, and love the city. In other words... Be present in the city that I've called you. Now, he doesn't call them to love or affirm the sin of the city. He, he, he doesn't call them to condone what they do in the city. But instead, he calls them to love and invest in the people. Now, there were these false prophets who were preaching at the time. And they were preaching that this exile was only going to last for a few years. And Jeremiah comes on the scene and he says, those false prophets are liars, right? They are false. Exile wasn't going to be over quick. Look, look with me at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So this exile was going to last 70 years. So seeking the city's welfare and, and praying for its people wasn't a season, it was a life calling. It, it wasn't something that was gonna be done quick. No, it was something that was going to take time. 
In fact, he, he says it's going to last for 70 years. So what he's telling the people who are, who are hearing this is some of you are going to die in Babylon. Some of you are going to die without making it back, without seeing the promised land. Some of you are going to make it, and some of your children and your grandchildren, they will make it back to the promised land. If this wasn't a season, it was a life calling. Now, Israel, there in this strange land, <clears throat> in this strange city. Yet the Lord was working through them to bless Babylon, but that's not all he was doing. He was also working something great in them. He was working in them a a persevering faith in God's promise. He was showing them that even as they had failed to believe his promises, that through this discipline, through this punishment, he was going to be just as faithful as he had ever been, and they were going to learn his faithfulness in a new way. See, what's interesting is that the reason that the Israelites had ended up in Babylon was because Babylon had been in them. They already captured the heart and the spirit of Babylon. They had already given themselves to idolatry. They had already given themselves uh, to the things of the world. They had already stopped trusting Yahweh and started trusting in themselves. And so it's as if the Lord, to get Babylon out of them, what does he do? He places them right in the middle of Babylon. Right, to, to get Babylon out of their hearts, to get this idolatry out of their hearts, he says, I'm going to place you right in the middle of what you think will deliver you. I'm going to place you right in the middle of what you think will satisfy you. I'm going to give you what you think you want. And I'm going to show you why that will end up destroying you. I'm going to show you why that will end up letting you down. See, gospel hope frees us to love where we live. We see here that our address matters and our prayers matter. And finally, we see this, your city matters. Our city matters. We've already said that your address matters. Our our God doesn't leave anything to chance. And this gospel hope, it, it frees us to love where we live. And so we've got to understand that our city matters. Look at the way verse seven ends. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. It ends with a promise. When when Babylon prospers, Israel will prosper. At one level, we get this, right? If things are good in Babylon, then things should be good for those who live there in Babylon, including exiles. But the story of Israel In this story here, it doesn't end with Babylon. The Lord isn't rooting Israel's ultimate hope there. Our hope is never and should never be found in how good the world is or in how good we can make it. Our hope must be, has to be, in the city that is yet to come. That's where the Lord roots their hope here as well. Look at verse 10 with me. Read down to verse 14. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to the place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me and when you seek me with your whole heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now we read that and we think there's hope. Right right in the middle of that passage uh, is the refrigerator magnet verse. Right, the coffee cup verse, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. We, we hear that verse and we think, God, I want some of that but we forget that it comes on the heels of exile. See, the the Lord isn't rooting their hope in how good Babylon can be. Instead, he roots it in another promise that he gives to his people. 
He's gonna bring them back to their land, give them their peace, hear their prayers, and restore their fortunes. I mean, that is hope. There is hope in that. But this hope doesn't end with Israel in the promised land. See, the promised land was a shadow to come. The promised land was a promised land. It wasn't the perfect land. Because in the promised land, there was still death. In the promised land, there was still sin. If there wasn't sin and death in the promised land, then Israel never would have gone into exile. But even living in the promised land, they had given themselves to idolatry. They had given themselves to sin. See, the promised land, just like everything else in the Old Testament, is a shadow of what was to come. God's promises were never meant to end with real estate. Instead, God's promise ends in a city that is still to come. See, ultimately, as God's people, we are all exiles in waiting. We wait for a better home that only the gospel can secure. We've said gospel hope frees us to love where we live, but we haven't talked about the gospel much. See, the the gospel is the truth that Jesus lived a perfect life that we have tried to live but can't. He died a sinner's death, taking the punishment that our sin deserves through his death on the cross. He was buried in a grave. And three days later, he rose from the grave. He defeated sin and he conquered death. And now anyone who will trust in him can have forgiveness and can have life and can have eternity with him. See, that that gospel hope that our eternity is with Jesus and the place that he has gone to prepare us for, that gospel hope, it frees us. Because it means that there's a city that's coming that, that we will experience real peace, and that city is where God dwells with his people. That, that city is the fulfillment that God, the, of the promise that God makes to his people in Jeremiah 33, where he says that I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will dwell with me, and I will dwell with you, and I will write my law on your hearts, and you will know me, and you will be like me. See, the city that matters is the city of God. See, as believers, we we live between two worlds. We live with one foot in the kingdom, in the city of God, and we live with another foot in the city of man, and we're straddling the two, and the Lord has called us to be present and to love the city of God, or to love the city of man where we find ourselves now, but the only reason we can love where we find ourselves now is because we know that there's a better city to come, and so our hope is not in this world and in this city and in this place, but our hope is in the city to come. See, gospel hope frees us to love where we live, but worldly hope forces you to use where you live. Worldly hope forces you to ask, what can I get out of this place? What can I get out of my life right now? Worldly hope forces us to ask, what is the next best thing that will feel good? What's the next best thing that will make me look good? What's the next best thing that will help me instead of trusting in God's grace right now? I've lived in this community for just over two and a half years. I mean, we we love this community. We we feel like we are at home. Uh, Last Sunday, we uh, we were driving to the store and I looked at my wife and I said, I love Florida. Uh, and she said, I don't just love Florida. I love this part of Florida. I love this place. I, I, I love these people. But as I talk to people who, who live in this community, most people typically fall in one of two camps. So there's, there's the first camp. They've lived in Sanford forever. They, they've lived here, grown up here. They'll die here. And... and Many of those that I talk to who are in that camp, when I talk to them, what they do is they talk about how Sanford has changed. Sanford isn't what it once was. I've had more than one conversation where I've been sitting in Cheddar's off of Reinhardt, and someone will tell me, you know, this used to be a goat field. 
You know, you, th- this used to be whatever. Uh, tell me stories about what downtown used to be or this house or that house. And I love hearing those stories because I, I love hearing the history. And uh, the, they'll talk about how Sanford just isn't what it once was and how they miss the, the small town feel of what used to be. But then there's another group. There's another group that, like me, they've come to Sanford more recently. And many of them have come from bigger cities or bigger towns or bigger communities. And they've, they've come because Sanford is a slower pace. Sanford is smaller. Sanford is a great place to raise their family. And so they can keep driving to Orlando or they can keep driving to this place or that place but they want to raise their family in Sanford. And you know what? Both groups are doing the same thing. They're both asking the same question. What can I get out of where I live? And I don't think that's necessarily a bad question to ask. But I don't know that it's the best question to ask. The best question to ask is not, what can I get out of where I live? How can I use where I live? Instead, the best question, the right question is, how can I love where I live? And when we say, how can I love where I live? The the question is not, how can I love all of the things that it affords me or that it gives me? But instead, how can I show and share the love of Jesus with where I live? Because where I live is not an accident. Where I live is, Matter. See, gospel hope offers us something better than asking, what can I get out of where I live? And instead, it frees us to actually love where we live, trusting that where we live, we are here because God has placed us here for such a time as this. God has put us here for a reason. God has put us here for a purpose, and that purpose is to make much of him. That purpose is to make much of the God who has saved us. So this gospel hope, it it frees us to love where we live. And so we can love where we live because we understand that this world is not our home. We love where we live because we understand that this world cannot satisfy, but that Jesus Christ has offered us a way for us to be satisfied. Right? Maybe, Maybe you can sing the song, I just can't get no satisfaction. But I try, and I try, and I try. Here's the thing. That's not just your story. That is our story. The great story of human history is us looking to be satisfied in things that cannot satisfy us. Power, money, fame, security, image. We're looking to be satisfied in things that cannot satisfy us. But when we understand and we realize that Jesus offers us real satisfaction, true satisfaction, lasting satisfaction, then we are free to live satisfied lives. And when we live satisfied lives then we love where we live. We love the people that have brought us, that the Lord has brought us to. And so here's my question, and then I'm going to sit down. Are, Are you building your hope on the city you live in now, the season you live in now, the place you live in now, Or are you building your hope in the city that is to come? Are you building your hope on what you can accomplish right now? Or are you rooting your hope in what Jesus has accomplished for you? If you're rooting your hope in what you can build and what you can accomplish and what you can do right now, you might have great happiness for a moment or for a season, but you will not enjoy joy for eternity. So I think, that, I think that the Lord cares about our happiness. But I think that more than our happiness, he cares about our joy. Yeah. See, happiness is for a moment. Happiness is fleeting. But joy is forever. Yeah. And when we're rooting our joy in anything other than Jesus, 
and anything other than the forgiveness and the eternity that he gives to us, then ultimately we end up disappointed. So maybe you say, Ethan, I need to talk to someone about this Jesus. I need to talk to someone about this gospel. Well, here at the end of the service, our Next Steps team will be down front. They have on green shirts. You can make your way down. They would love to talk with you. They'd love to pray with you. love to just see what the Lord is doing in your life. Sometimes coming down front is like a salmon swimming upstream and maybe you can't get to it, but you can leave this room and you'll see our next step table set up. You'll see next green next step banners. There are people there that would love to talk with you and love to pray with you about what does it look like to trust Jesus? Maybe say, even I've trusted Jesus, but I need to get baptized. Maybe that's your, your next step is you need to get baptized. You can go talk with someone on our next steps team. They, they'd love to talk with you about what, is it, uh, what does it mean uh, to be baptized? How, how can we set that up? You know, I, I tell people, I'm an introvert that lives in an extrovert's world. Right? Like I'm an introvert, uh, but uh, just the nature of my job is I get to be an extrovert. Some of you are like me. You're introverts and the, the mere thought of going to talk to someone that you don't know in a green shirt about Jesus terrifies you. It it makes you nervous. Here's what I want you to know. The people in those green shirts, they want to talk to you. The people in those green shirts, they want to pray with you. The people in those green shirts are just like you. So I'm gonna pray and we are going to sing. And I wanna encourage you not to leave here looking for satisfaction in somewhere other than Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you that because of Jesus, we can have satisfaction. Because of Jesus, we can have grace and forgiveness. And so, Father, I pray that none of us would leave this place looking for satisfaction in what this world can give us, looking for satisfaction in what we can pull out of this world, but instead we would find real satisfaction, lasting satisfaction in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that that as we press into, as we look to, as we remember our gospel hope, Father, I pray that we would be freed to love where you have placed us. So Father, we pray this and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to today's message. Again, we hope that this message blessed you in some way. Now, you've come to church. Go be the church. Have a great week of worship.